This is Limitless Spirit, a practical, inspirational, and thought-provoking weekly podcast about the impact of faith and Christian identity in today's world. And now here's your host, champion of Jesus and people who love Him, world traveler and co-founder of World Missions Alliance, Helen Todd. Welcome to episode 6 of the Limitless Spirit podcast. Today we continue the conversation with Jason Thacker on the subject of artificial intelligence from Christian perspective. Jason Thacker serves as Associate Research Fellow and Creative Director at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. He is also the author of the book, The Age of AI, Artificial Intelligence, and the Future of Humanity, published by Zondervan and coming out on March 2020. He writes and speaks on various topics, including human dignity, ethics, technology, and artificial intelligence. In the previous episode, he brought up an interesting point about AI being a new form of materialism, a non-human form that can potentially be elevated above humans because it has the capacity to outperform us. But is it truly possible for creation to rise above its creator? And is the world empowered by AI going to be a safer place or a more dangerous place? Let's hear Jason's thoughts on this subject. The only general intelligence that our world has ever known is human beings, uh, meaning that we can uh, take knowledge and apply it to a general task. Um, While my dog or different animals have certain levels of intelligence, there's nothing to the level of human level intelligence other than humanity. We don't have a machine that can do that. So are you saying that it doesn't exist currently? There's a lot of questions if that's even possible, because we don't really know what the nature of uh, consciousness or what makes a human human when you get strictly into the science uh, scientific set or what is what makes the brain alive. And so you get a lot of these really deep questions that people have asked for a number of years, but we have this new opportunity, possible opportunity to create general AI. Um, that's where you get a lot of questions about, well, how does that affect my family or my work? Or how does that affect even issues such as warfare um, and drone systems and different things like that? Well, and with that, come so many more questions. If general AI is created, what do we consider it to be? Is it it, uh, an entity that should deserve rights or, (laughs) you know, it it really brings us into a whole new set of questions. So how far are we from it, in your opinion? (laughs) That's a really uh, hard question because Within the AI community, the verdict's still out if it's even possible. Some uh, computer scientists and researchers will say, no, it's not possible. We'll never create it. Some aren't really sure. Some even say within 20 years or 40 years or 50 or 60. So there's this, this sliding kind of timetable, and there isn't consensus within the AI community and even within culture at large is what is the timeline if this is not even indeed possible? Um, Because again, we don't, a lot of times when we think about artificial intelligence, we do think about it from this more materialistic type of sense of saying, well, if we can create something that acts like a human or talks like a human, then maybe they do have, this entity has rights or this entity has, uh, is like a human or is on the same level as a human. But as Christians, we step into it and completely reframe the question of saying, You're a human being, not because of what you can do, not because you're smart, not because you can think, uh, not because you have these abilities, whether physical or mental abilities. You're a human being, and the essence of that is the image of God. You're created in God's image, and that cannot be changed. Uh, You cannot lose the image of God. You are created in God's image, and that's a, a designation. That's something that God has given you, and you can't redefine that nor can anything else be made in the image of God. And so having that kind of robust understanding of human dignity of, I like to start with some big questions of who is God, then who are we created in God's image, and then what is technology? Technology isn't a separate entity. It's not something that has moral agency. It's something, a tool that we're, we were given the ability to create by God and given the ability to create for His glory and for the love of neighbor. And so if we continually keep the idea that technology, specifically AI, 
is a tool that God has given us to use and to wield with wisdom, then I think a lot of the more difficult questions, while they're still difficult, are a little bit easier to address because I don't believe that we're able to give or create something that has moral agency on the same level as a human being. Nor do I think a machine has rights outside of the <laughs> rights that other types, you know, we say like, an, it's wrong to abuse animals. Well, why? Well, because we're called to be stewards of God's creation and to love and to care for animals. But no one would equate the idea of kill, uh, an animal and a human death. There's just something very different in that. And that's what really comes down to being created in God's image and being unique and distinct in all of creation. I couldn't agree with you more, but you and I have the same system of values, you know, but what about people? I know that you're also uh, a member of an interfaith group um, called AI and Faith. So that includes people of different religions. Uh, mm -hmm. What What is the... Uh, opinion among the members of different faiths on that subject. Yeah, and the, the there are varying opinions among faith groups. So one thing that faith groups do have in common is the distinctiveness and the uniqueness of humanity. Um, whether we ground that as Christians in the image of God through what the scripture tells us about who God is, what he's done for us through the cross of Christ, or a different faith sees that in a different book of faith or understanding of God, there is something unique that there is something bigger than us. We are not the, we are, while we're the crowning point of creation, we're not gods in ourselves. We're, we don't have, we're limited. We don't have control. We don't know everything. And I think that even as you engage with people with no faith, there is that kind of understanding what Paul tells us is the truth suppressed in unrighteousness. We know Every human being knows that there is a God, whether we believe it or not, or where we try to push that down and act like it doesn't exist. We know that there's something bigger than us. And so I think as Christians, we have the unique opportunity to step in to bring clarity that, to that and say, this is what it means. This is why there's a difference between a machine, an AI system, and a human. There just is. There's a fundamental value difference there. And everyone, for the most part, understands that. And if they don't, what they're doing is they're assigning dignity that's not theirs to assign to a machine and really defining themselves down, saying, I'm nothing but a machine. I'm nothing but a group of cells. There's nothing really special or unique about me. And that doesn't sit well with a lot of people because people want to believe that humanity is distinct and unique and there's something special and that love is not just a chemical reaction. It's actually an emotion. It's core to who we are. Um, and how God has created us. And so as we engage, whether it's with people of faith or with no faith at all, there is kind of an apologetic work uh, that we can do. And there's a huge opportunity to share the gospel. See, I love that because coming from the perspective of a missionary and the leader of a missions organization, I see this as a whole new opportunity to and, and the need to share the gospel in the world because we're facing some really, really big issues that cannot be really solved in the right way without the right frame of mind and, and heart. Yeah, you're exactly right. And even in terms of how AI is being used on um, in mission applications is really interesting how systems like chatbots are starting to be used where people can ask some deep theological questions to a chatbot. And that bot, typically online, kind of like a chat room setting, answers these questions, pulling from history or pulling from the scriptures. Um, and so I've had a lot of questions of mi even missionaries asking, how should we use these tools? Or is it good and right to use these tools on the mission field uh, to do even digital evangelism? So what is your opinion? Because now I'm having very mixed feelings and emotions <laughs> about this. Well, and I think what we need to do is, again, keep those fundamental truths at the very top, is that we are creating God's image, that the flesh and blood is real and something that we should prioritize. But we can also use these tools to communicate truth. So just like I get on Google and I might search for a Bible reference or I might ask a question per se of the technology, that's an AI actually driving the search algorithm, by the way. A lot of people don't think that they interact with AI much. It's something that's in 5 or 10 or 15, 20 years down the road. You use it every single day, whether it's through your banking, through manufacturing, through your computer systems. 
Um, you're interacting with AI every single day. And so I think what we as Christians need to think about in the missions context is it's very similar to using like a search database for looking up Bible references and different things like that. But at no point does that become a substitute for authentic flesh and blood encounters and authentic flesh and blood community. We're called to be part of the local church. And the church is a gathering of people created in God's image, gathering to worship him and to learn about him and to grow in righteousness and holiness. So I think we can use these tools in ways to research or to know or to share truth. But at no point do these tools become substitutes for authentic Christian community seen in the local life of the church. Well, after all, as Christians, we're led by the Holy Spirit in our interactions with people, and that can never be replaced by any machine. So Exactly. And so these tools are very valuable and good, and we should pur- pursue righteous and uh, helpful uses of these tools. But at no point can they take the place of another human being or be seen as, as valuable um, as another human being in terms of their dignity or worth. Considering the potential dangerous use of AI, like weaponizing AI and other aspects of it, there should be some kind of a global framework for use of it, don't you think? Yes and no. I mean, I do think that we need to have a common understanding and morality, but we also know these are going to be applied in different ways in different cultures and contexts. Exactly. So so that's where my concern is. How can the world be safe then? Yeah, and that's a lot of times where ultimately, this isn't a cop-out for me, it's ultimately we have to trust the Lord. We know that God is sovereign and that he's in control of all things, and we already know the end of the story. We know at the very end of time when God comes to rescue his people that we are going to be gathered around his throne, Revelation 21, seeing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We know that's true. We know that God is reigning and ruling even now. And so what we do is we step into these difficult questions uh, with confidence and without fear, knowing that there are real consequences to our decisions and real consequences to how we use these tools. And so in terms of like a global consensus, there has been a lot of work done uh, with Various countries um, putting together ethical frameworks or guidelines, companies doing very similar things. And so what I want to do and what we want to do through uh, what I want to do through the book, but also what I want to do through the statement of principles we did is to foster a healthy dialogue among very diverse people. So it's not that Christians just need to be talking about this or Muslims just need to be talking about this or secularists. We all need to be coming to the table and talking about these things. And often that's going to be through local community, fostering good, healthy dialogue in our communities and our municipalities. Same is true at the government level. And you already are starting to see this happen in places like the United Nations, who actually put together a report on artificial intelligence, or the Catholic Church, who has done a lot of work in this area, that are more global bodies. Well, it is encouraging to hear that, you know, there is, this is already being discussed and worked on. I um, listened to an interview with Elon Musk that you mentioned, and uh, he seemed to be extremely concerned about how little is being discussed about it in various circles of society. And so it's it's great to know that um, at least the dialogue is there. And and I, I think it's encouraging, you know, it can become a point of maybe uniting different groups and even different faiths, because after all, we all share the same planet, uh, you know, and, and we all have the desire to live and not die. <laughs> and uh, so maybe it can become a point of unity and, and dialogue in a healthy way. Yeah, and I do agree with um, Musk that there needs to be more done. Um, This isn't something that it's perfect and we don't need to really be talking about anymore. We need to increasingly be talking about these things because there are real effects for real human people or human beings, whether it's, you know, the rise of self-driving car technology and just imagining one, it would be, I personally think it would be really neat to be able to use this type of tool. But then I also have to think about the societal impact of what happens if we do a mass implementation of self-driving car technology. Well, think of anyone who works in the transportation industry, from truckers, delivery people, 
those who work on on these uh, vehicles or those who build them or sell them. And you just think of the massive impact on our economy, even just within the United States, much less globally. Uh, so there are real right. deep questions here that need to be addressed. And so, yeah, we do need to see more dialogue. We do need to see more people uh, joining and having a seat at the table. And that's one thing that I hope through a lot of my work is that I can encourage believers who are already working in the field. There's so many faithful believers who are util- building and designing these systems with that idea of glorifying God and loving our neighbor is encouraging them to step forward and be confident in their faith and say, hey, we need to be, I want to talk about how I view this and how I think about this or what my faith says about it. And having that open dialogue among various faith groups, but also among just gener- uh, society at large, whether it's here just in the United States or into other countries and different areas. Well, you're definitely on the forefront of this issue from the Christian perspective. I'm not aware of another book on that subject coming out from specifically Christian perspective. That's why I think it's very exciting and I look forward to reading it. So to sum up our conversation, what would you say for Christians, the most important thing that they need to know and what can they do to make a difference and and be impactful as we're facing this new technology? Yeah, I think first and foremost is knowing that you are unique and that you're created in God's image and that you have infinite value and worth no matter what you do. It, your value isn't determined on how you how much work you can get done or what you can do for your family or how you provide for yourself. And so as we engage a lot of these deeper kind of theological questions about humanity and the nature of God is keeping that truth at the center and the core of it is that you're made in God's image, you're unique, and that your value and worth isn't depending on what you do. And so as we enter into a digital age where more and more of our jobs will be automated or be replaced knowing that work is core to who we are, but that we are called to step in with faith and to love and to honor and keep that idea of human dignity at the forefront. And so when we use these technologies, realizing that the person across the uh, street and even across the screen is a real person created in God's image. And so not defining uh, human humanity down, but really uplifting that truth, keeping that central to everything we do. And then even taking the practical steps of reading a good book or listening to a good podcast and educating yourselves on what, how this technology is already impacting our life and what's maybe potentially coming really can help us and navigate this digital age well and with wisdom. And hopefully we will see many, many people come to saving faith and Jesus Christ as a result of our faithfulness as we apply our beliefs to these really difficult questions. And of course, pray. Pray for government leaders, not only in our country, but in other countries and business leaders for wisdom and, and you know, understanding and, and the desire to use it in a way that will not harm humanity. Exactly. You're exactly right. And that's one of the, again, the reasons that I wrote the book was to put forth kind of an ethic or a framework or an understanding of how Christians can faithfully engage. So that book comes out in March of next year. Um, But then also we put together a whole host of resources through my organization, the ERLC, in order to equip Christians, everyday Christians, to engage a lot of these deep and kind of concerning questions at times uh, with the hope of Jesus Christ. We're going to post the links that you shared with me uh, to these resources in the show notes. But uh, while I have you um, on this conversation, where would people be able to purchase your book? How can they purchase your book when it comes out? It's available at most online retailers, including Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Um, Probably the easiest way is to go directly to my website, jasonthacker.com. And there is a link of every place you can purchase it. And this kind of puts it all together. You can learn a little bit more about the book and see a lot of the other writings that I've done on technology and artificial intelligence. And they can pre-order the book, right? They can be ahead of the game. They don't have to wait till March. You'll make um, an author very happy if you pre-order his book um, because publishers love that. And that's a way to make sure and to guarantee that you receive it on the day that it comes out. 
on March 3rd. Uh, but you can pre-order now. And the best part is it's already on discount on a lot of places, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So you know you're going to get the best price available. If you enjoy this podcast and are listening to us on iTunes, please take a minute to write a review. This will help us tremendously to get the word out. I look forward to hearing from you with any comments, suggestions, or questions. Send me an email to podcast at rfwma.org. Tune in for more episodes. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Limitless Spirit with Helen Todd, produced by World Missions Alliance. Are you ready to step out of your comfort zone? Do you have a passion to help people and share your faith across the globe? Visit our website, rfwma.org, and get involved in the Great Commission through short-term missions. We hope you'll leave a review and check out other episodes. We'll be with you in a week on our next episode of Limitless Spirit.